It is now with great pleasure that I get to introduce George Kachatrian, co-founder and CEO of OfferFit. George is one of the brilliant minds in our community. He has a PhD in mathematics from Cornell. He was at McKinsey before co-founding OfferFit. His presentation last year on chat GPT and automated experimentation was a huge hit, and we're thrilled to have him back to talk about how AI-powered personalization is redefining lifecycle marketing. Please join me in welcoming George to the stage. So today we're going to discuss how AI-powered personalization is redefining lifecycle marketing. And in particular, we're going to talk about the traditional approach, which is called next best action, and what are some of the problems and limitations with that, and how given recent advances in AI, that's getting replaced with a new approach called AI testing. So what qualifies me to talk on this subject? I'm the co-founder and CEO of OfferFid. We're a tech company that provides AI testing software for marketers. Um, we have a lot of amazing customers, brands like Yelp, MetLife, and other great companies. We have a team of about 100 folks and growing more than two times a year. So I find that for a lot of marketers, AI and machine learning is, is like a black box. Even if you're using it currently in your companies, maybe with custom-built models or through vendors that you work with, um, it's hard to get information as a marketer of what's actually inside these models and how do they work. So my goal today is to demystify that a little bit and open up the black box for you as it relates to AI machine learning for making decisions for identified individuals in the context of lifecycle marketing. In particular, we're gonna cover four things. So first, just to level set, what is machine learning anyways? And what are the four main types of machine learning? Then we'll talk about next best action, which is the traditional way to use machine learning in order to make personalized decisions for, for customers. And then finally, we'll talk about what's, what's starting to replace it, which is AI testing and how that works. This all goes back to classical statistics, which was mostly developed in the first half of the 20th century. And so here's an example of something you would, you would do in classical statistics. You have a bunch of historical data. Imagine each point is a group of customers, like a cohort, that all started with your company at the same time. And you know for them how long have they been your customer, and you want to predict of those people what proportion are going to repurchase your product within a certain time frame. So it's like a propensity to repurchase. And so in classical statistics, you're going to draw a line. You'll fit a line to this data. And so you can think of that line as learning. You've taken this historical data. That line that you fit is learning from that data. And it allows you to make new predictions. So for a new group of customer that maybe wasn't in your historical data or an individual, you can now look up on the x-axis how long have they been a customer. And then you can connect the dots and see, OK, what's the propensity to repurchase for that individual? And so that's classical statistics. But of course, in real life, data doesn't always look beautifully linear. Sometimes it does squiggly things. And so in those cases, you can still fit a line, but you can tell it's maybe not, not the ideal fit. Right? In this case, ideally, you'd want to do something that maybe looks more like this. Classical statistics didn't really focus on this, and the reason for that is because to fit this type of shape to data, you need to do a lot of computations, way more than you can do with pencil and paper or a slide rule and so forth. And so as a result, classical statistics was focused on linear situations. That all started to change in the 1980s and 1990s. A lot more compute became available, and so it started to make sense to actually do research and figure out how to do this type of fitting. And that became known as the field of machine learning. And so why is it called machine learning? Just like our line learned from the data and then made predictions, here we're doing the exact same thing. We're learning from data, but we're using the power of computers, machines, in order to do all of those computations that are needed in order to do you know, more complicated things like this. Now, of course, in real life, you don't always have one variable on your x-axis that you're predicting on. You might have multiple ones. Like, you might know, how long has someone been a customer? How many purchases did they make in the last 90 days? Are they in the loyalty program? Maybe 100 other things. And then you're going to put that into a linear model in your classic statistical situation, and you're going to output a propensity to repurchase. With machine learning, it's the exact same idea. You're taking that same data about people, but now you're putting it into a model that's nonlinear, so it can find more complicated relationships between your input variables and what it outputs, and then it's going to output something. And if done right, that's going to allow you to be much more accurate. So that's really the benefit of machine learning, is it allows you to get much more precise. And so you've probably heard about some of the particular ways that people build models that do this. They have fancy names like neural networks or gradient boosting machines or support vector machines. But essentially, it's a very simple idea. It's just taking input data 
and then in some nonlinear way generating an output in order to fit certain, certain data that you may have. So that's really all that machine learning is. It's just a generalization of good old fashioned classical statistics from linear situations to doing more complicated things in the search of better precision. Now, um, within machine learning, there are four sub-branches that correspond to different uses of machine learning. And these are prediction, pattern identification, generation, and decisioning. They have more fancy names that are used by machine learning practitioners. And all of them have applications in marketing and probably things you're familiar with. So like in prediction, you have things like propensity to re repurchase, propensity to churn, category affinity. These are all predictive models. In pattern identification, of course, lookalikes. Many of you have done that. You take a group of customers, you pass it to Facebook, you ask them to find similar customers so you can market to those people. That's an example of pattern identifying machine learning. Generation, we've all played with chat GPT uh, or generating images. That's, that's you know, generative models. And then finally, decisioning. So these are machine learning agents whose whole purpose is to make decisions. They're not making a prediction about a customer. They're actually deciding what action to take in order to maximize some KPI, like revenue or conversions. And an example of that is, is AI testing. And this, this fourth area is actually offer fits focus. So let's talk about the traditional next best action. And what I think I'll um, hopefully show you is, first of all, just how does that work? Many of you maybe have either used next best action at your companies or you've heard of companies that use next best action. So when you hear that, what does that actually mean? And then what are some of the limitations or problems with this, with this traditional approach? So in next best action, you start with your customer base and then you build a collection of predictive models. So you're using that first bucket of machine learning. So for example, things like propensity to churn, propensity to repurchase, category affinity, and so forth. And so you end up with a score on a scale of zero to 100 for each customer among your customer base. And so already you might see a problem, which is that prediction is not the same as decisioning. You have a score for each person, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to do in order to maximize the performance of your campaigns with that person. So my favorite example here is that I'm, I'm the father of a two and a half year old, and so my wife and I buy a lot of diapers. I have a very high category affinity for diapers, but that does not mean that you should market diapers to me because how many diapers we buy is gonna depend on my son's digestion that month, much more than on which, which emails I get from, from a diaper company. And so, there needs to be something a bit more complicated than just saying, you know, high on, high on this, so do this to this customer. And so how do, how do people solve this in the next best action framework? Well, you take your customer base in these scores and you divide people into segments. So in this case, you have propensity to churn and you group people into five buckets based on their score and then same on category affinity and you end up with 25 groups of customers in that grid. And so each group is a segment and then you're gonna have some kind of rule of how you market to that segment. So for each of those 25 groups, you're gonna do something different. So there's a problem with that, which some of you may already see, which is that what it means is that if two people end up in that same segment, we're going to market to them in the exact same way. And so initially, we might feel like we're using all of our first party data. You've taken this very rich data that you have, you've passed it into these machine learning models, it's great, we're doing AI, we're doing ML, we're using all of our first party data. But there's a problem. We've taken it and now we've boiled people down to these segments and then after that, we're not looking at that data anymore. So let's look at an example. Benjamin and Michael are both in the same segment. They both have high propensity to churn and about kind of mid-range category affinity for baby products. But it might be for very different reasons. Benjamin is a grandfather. He's a bit of a doting grandparent. He buys a lot of toys for his grandkids, so hence the category affinity. And he recently had a bad customer service experience. And so he's frustrated with, with the company and he's thinking of taking his business elsewhere because he's been a loyal customer and he's dissatisfied that he wasn't treated accordingly. Michael is a college senior. Uh, he's likely to turn because he's gonna graduate and move to a different city. Um, and in his case, he, he did some babysitting in college to supplement his income and so as a result, he has some, some category affinity for baby products. So the action that you need to take for these two people is actually not identical. Ideally, what Benjamin needs is a phone call and an apology for the bad experience so that he feels valued as a customer. What Michael needs is maybe wait a few months and then send him a coupon so we can get him in the habit of shopping with us after he moves to a new city. But in this next best action approach, we don't have the ability to do that because we've thrown away all of that rich data that we have. But we do have that data, we know. Maybe, you know, how long have they been a customer? Responses to satisfaction surveys. So we maybe know that Benjamin had a bad service experience because maybe he told us himself. 
basket sizes, channels, purchase frequency, email interactions, web browsing behavior. But in this traditional next best action approach, we're really not using any of that apart from putting people in these buckets based on their, their scores. The second problem you can probably tell here is some of the ways that you can segment people are informative for things like product or incentive. But there's other decisions that as a marketer you need to make. Channel, frequency, send time, time of day. And so something like your churn propensity isn't really informative on those things. And so again, when you do this next best action, you're sort of stuck not being able to decision on those things unless you have separate grids for each thing that you're decisioning on and it just becomes enormously complex. So that's all the first problem with the traditional next best action. It's just not very personalized. But there's a second problem. And so we kind of took everybody, we divided them up into these segments, and then we're gonna have rules for each segment. Well, where do those rules come from? And so in many cases, it's kind of a, a conjecture, right? Well, we think maybe for the segment this is the right thing to do. And I like to call that it's not next best action, it's kind of next best guess. Uh, and, and so for marketers, when they're more sophisticated about this, you can actually do a bunch of A-B testing. And this is what companies that have very large marketing teams and that are very advanced in doing this will do, is for each of these segments, they'll do a bunch of experimentation to figure out what is the performance maximizing thing to do for that segment of people. So here's an AI-generated image of someone waiting for one of those A-B tests to reach statistical significance. And as you can tell, the, the more fancy you try to get with this and the smaller your segments, the longer you're gonna have to wait for each of these tests the harder it is to do this experimentation work. And every time you wanna change something, you're gonna to have to redo an inordinate amount of testing. So that's why these, these models, when they're used, become very, very cumbersome to maintain. So from an AI machine learning practitioner's point of view, this is all kind of crazy. And the reason for that is you've basically taken in next best action predictive models and you've shoehorned them to do decisioning through this very cumbersome system of segments, rules, and A-B tests. There actually exists a branch of machine learning whose whole purpose is decisioning. These are models that are natively built to do decisioning. Um, but of course, this is a more recently developed field. It's more complex in certain ways. And so that's why certain companies do the traditional approach to next best action still today. It's because it's more accessible in some ways. But it's quickly becoming, becoming obsolete. So let's talk about decisioning, and in particular, AI testing, and how that works. So for these models, their output is not a prediction. Their output is actually a decision, but their inputs are the exact same. So you pass all of the first party data, and then for each customer, AI testing agents will output decisions of what incentive to give them, um, what channel to communicate with them through, uh, what time should you do that. And they're doing this with the aim of maximizing your performance. And so this, this process in marketing can be described as AI testing because you're using these AI agents to essentially replace the whole testing and decisioning process. How does that work in practice? Well, either with OfferFit or with any other AI testing tool that you use, it becomes a new point in your tech stack between your data systems and your marketing automation tools. And so your customer data gets fed into your AI testing agent and the AI testing agent then makes decisions at the individual customer level. So for Veronica, send this email at this time with this subject line and this incentive. For George, uh, send this text message with no incentive at this time. For somebody else, do nothing today. Then that all gets executed, executed through your marketing automation tools, and it's a continuous loop. So several days later, the AI, the AI agent checks back and it looks what happened with these decisions. I made these decisions, which of them led to good outcomes in the form of revenue or conversions or whatever you're seeking to maximize, which of them did not, and that allows them to get smarter at finding out for each customer based on their characteristics, what are the actions and tactics to be using in order to maximize the outcomes of your campaigns. And so let me just give you a couple of examples to bring this to life. Uh, one of them, this is a customer of OfferFit, is a leading credit card company. And one reason I like this example is because they're known to have one of the most sophisticated marketing teams out there. And so the journey that they started using AI testing for was already very thoroughly A-B tested and optimized. And it was the credit card refer a friend for small business cards. And so they already knew if you're gonna be emailing everybody the same thing, what's the best time of day, day of the week, subject line, and so forth. And so the reason they deployed AI testing is to use their first party data to personalize much more strongly to where for each person, you're now making not just you know, whatever's best for everybody on average generically, you're actually sending what's best for that individual. And so in their case, they ended up nearly doubling the performance of that campaign, which was already very well optimized, and that amounted to 16 million of annualized bottom line value 
which as you can imagine is a big deal for their business. So they're doing a big rollout right now where they're gonna be deploying AI testing across multiple points in their customer journey. Another example is a leading review app, which many of you may have on your phone. And so in that case, they already had a very sophisticated data science team. They were already optimizing push notifications. How do you maximize people's engagement with, uh, with, their, with their reviews? And so they deployed AI testing to further strengthen the personalization so that for each person, you know, who do you send a push notification about plumbers versus nightlife? What time of day? What day of the week? How frequently? So you avoid people uninstalling the app or silencing the push notifications. And got over 50% uplift in push to session conversions. So this can be quite, quite impactful when, uh, when, when used correctly. So the way that I like to think about this is it's, it's kind of going with AI testing from next best action to next best everything. And the reason I like to describe it that way is it's next best everything in two ways. First of all, you're now actually using all of your first party data. With traditional next best action, you sort of have the illusion that you're using all of your first party data. And in a way it's true, you're feeding it into these predictive models. But then when these models output scores, you end up boiling people down to segments and you're, you're not really differentiating between people that fall in the same segment. And so as a result, with next best action, you have the sense that you're using all your first party data, you're not really capturing the richness. Whereas with AI testing, because these models are built to be natively decisioning, you are. And the second reason relates to the output. With next best action, you construct some segmentation, maybe it'll help you choose something like your discount level or which product to talk about. But there are all these other things that you wanna be decisioning on. Frequency, time of day, channel, and so forth. And with AI testing, it lends itself much more naturally to this than trying to construct you know, multiple next best action structures to solve this. So what are some of the things that we, that we covered today? Just to recap, first of all, machine learning, it sounds very mysterious. It's actually just a generalization of classical statistics. It's just good old fashioned statistics that we all love, generalized from linear relationships to be able to do more complex, not necessarily linear relationships, all in the name of better, better accuracy. Uh, there are four main types of machine learning. They all share a common toolkit, but they also have very distinct tools and capabilities that have been developed for each of these four types, uh, which is prediction, pattern identification, generation, and decisioning. And the traditional next best action approach, even though you often hear about it in, in concepts of like, oh, this is very advanced, this is very sophisticated. Well, that was probably true you know, 10, 20 years ago, but in fact, it has a lot of issues because it's taking um, predictive machine learning and shoehorning that to do decisioning, which it wasn't meant to do through this intricate system of segments, rules, and A-B tests. And in fact, so as a result, it ends up being very slow, very cumbersome to maintain as a marketer, and also just not very personalized. And then finally, this is being replaced with recent advancements in AI with AI testing, which is about using decisioning machine learning. So these are AI models, AI agents, which are built to be making decisions, not just to be making predictions. That's what they're natively designed to do. And so that has two main benefits. The first is you end up making much more personalized, high quality decisions because you're truly using all of your first party data. And then second of all, it's, it's a much more elegant setup. It's not so cumbersome to maintain with all of these segments and rules, which even for very large companies is hard. Instead with AI testing, it's a much simpler setup because you have these machine learning models and they make the decisions. And if, once you set things up, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a simple, robust configuration. So uh, thank you very much. If you're interested in learning more about this, feel free to drop by our booth. We're, we're here on the third floor in booth 201. And also for qualifying companies, we offer something called AI Academy if you're interested in learning more or if you think some of your colleagues wanna go, go in depth. And so at no cost, we have a team of two instructors that will come to your office and run a one-day hands-on workshop to discuss um, recent advancements in AI, including AI testing. And so if that's something that potentially is of interest to you and, uh, and your colleagues, feel free to talk to us about this or go to go.offerfit.ai slash academy. Thank you very much.